Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live, and today we have a very special guest that my wife will be introducing to, to you today. And of course, my wife, Yana Benun, is also in studio here with us. And I think it's going to be very eye-opening. So definitely stay tuned, listen to the entire broadcast, and share as much as you possibly can. Because as you know, they don't like it when we put out these types of interviews. Anyway, Yana? Well, we are welcoming in our studio Daniel McAdams, and welcome, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, and uh, I'll just introduce you a little bit. You are Executive Director of Rampo Institute for Peace and Security. You advocate for peaceful foreign policy for the United States. You served as Defense Policy Advisor to United States Congressman Ron Paul in Texas from 2001 until end of 2012. And from 1993 till 1999, you worked as a journalist based in Budapest, Hungary, where you monitored elections and human rights issues. And wow, that's amazing because I'm from East Europe. And I want to ask you this question, Daniel. Um, uh -huh. The Basils Modjaru. I can keep it. I keep it. Thank you so much. A boldog vagyunk, hogy itt vagy velünk. Elfelejtettem majdnem mindent. Én is elfelejtettem. Hülye, hülye vagyok. No, the world is small, what can I say? Well, welcome here in the studio and uh, I will give a word to Steve right now. Uh, that is so nice. By the way, that's a Hungarian language and no, I'm not going to put the subtitles up because I have no idea what either one of them had to say. Well, I can, but... I can put them up for you. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Uh, Daniel, we really appreciate you coming on, and uh, we just like to thank you for your time and also uh, to give our greetings to Dr. Ron Paul as well. The incredible work the two of you are doing to educate America uh, in global events and how it impacts the United States. Uh, we really wanted to take and focus with you on a number of issues in the Middle East that is, that is slowly but surely dragging uh, our nation here as Americans is dragging us into a direction that's a little bit uh, nerve-wracking and I'd like to start with you if you don't mind going back in Syria and we can even go back in time but we know it's even been more recent uh, in Duma Syria all these alleged chemical attacks uh, that have happened and some of them no doubt have been real attacks like in the case of 2013 when the first uh, sarin gas attack happened in Syria uh, and just discuss a little bit about that, how this has really set the stage, set world opinion uh, about Syria and President Bashar al-Assad. And uh, we'd like to get your thoughts on this. Well, you know, unfortunately, what you see in Syria is a, is a multi-year destabilization effort that goes back at least until, at least back to 2005 and probably earlier on. And we know, thanks to WikiLeaks, that there were embassy cables from U.S. Embassy Damascus down back to Washington with detailed plans on how to destabilize the Syrian government. And ironically, one of them was to stir up radical Islam uh, and to motivate people to rise up. And so uh, they, you know, they, dragged, they grabbed the tiger by the tail, and uh, whether it was uh, intended or unintended, you know, that's, that's tough to decide, but they really created a monster. So they started in, in 05, 06 at least. And then, of course, in 2011, you had the so-called Arab Spring, uh, which I was very skeptical about at the time, but Syria got sucked into that. Uh, and what started, what some believe started as a domestic uh, group of, uh, you know, sort of uh, pro uh, protests against the government ended up, of course, in not only a bloody conflict, multi-year conflict, uh, but one that has been supported, unfortunately, by outside forces and has led to at least probably half a million people dead. Uh, very true. You know, you mentioned the Arab Spring, and I don't want to go too far off on that issue there, but I will share with you, Daniel, that, uh, and we've said this many times on Israeli News Live, uh, I was invited to D.C. a number of years back, and it was actually uh, at the invitation of one of Obama's Secret Service agents that also worked under uh, President Bush as well. Actually, he accompanied President Bush around the globe. And he shared with me private information. He spoke about the, the Arab Spring, uh, the man that set himself on fire in Tunisia. And he claimed that this was actually being done uh, under a, a, a 
a, a black op by the U.S. government, mind control, and that, again, they tried to do that in the U.S. to bring, uh, bring protests in America, and he claimed that the same incident was tried with the man that set himself on fire there in D.C. Uh, at the National Mall. And so, you know, it's just strange how things keep happening, and, and you cannot help but wonder, where, where is this all going? Yeah, and and, and I, I I'm with you there. I mean, I'm with the, your your friend there. I think there certainly was an element of a black op, a covert operation. Uh, you know, that when you see people like Gene Sharp, who your your viewers may know or may not know, but he was sort of the father of the color revolutions, the father of the so-called peaceful revolutions. He had been a contractor with the CIA. He was uh, into the idea of uh, of overthrowing governments peacefully. Uh, so to speak, but it didn't really work out that way. But you also had uh, an overt aspect of this. Hillary Clinton's State Department was very active in training the youth, teaching them how to use social media to mobilize protests. Uh, and on one hand, you could say, well, it was just uh, great just to liberate people. But in fact, it wasn't used uh, for that. It was used to forward uh, what Clinton believed, what the neocons believed, what the interventionists believed, to be U.S. national interests, and everywhere you look at the Arab Spring, uh, you see nothing but autumn, <laughs> to, to continue the metaphor, you see nothing but disaster. Tunisia is certainly no better off. Is Egypt any better off? They're back to status quo ante. Uh, so nowhere where they had this, how about Libya? There's one for you. Nowhere where this wonderful uprising started do you see anything better, in fact, far, far worse. Absolutely. You know, speaking about Libya, you know, this is, of course, the whole issue in Libya is what opened up the door for the sarin gas, according to uh, Seymour Hirsch, the incredible investigative journalist, uh, to do the rat line that he writes about that that was taken uh, with the uh, complicity of Erdogan uh, through Turkey. And then Aaron Erdem, who was the MP member at the time, uh, comes out on RT. And I've actually watched his speech there before parliament in Turkey, where he was taking the literal police investigative reports uh, that they had captured militants of ISIS, they had captured government officials, uh, they had been tapping their phones, and that they were taking sarin gas in, and he implicated Erdogan uh, when he was then prime minister, allowing that to go into Syria to be used against the Syrian regime and blamed on them. So all of these are just black ops, and unfortunately, I have a little bit of hand in that because I worked with the uh, Central Intelligence Agency myself from 1983 to 1990, and I know full well how the U.S. government takes and we bring in drugs. I didn't know they were doing that at the time when I was involved with it, but I was involved with an element that I knew about the arms that were being sent to Central America. And, uh, and, and the cover-ups and the politicians that were involved uh, in, the, in the money laundering in order to be able to supply those weapons, it's just a disaster uh, what's going on there. Uh, Daniel, uh, let's, if we yeah. can, let's, I'd like to ask you about the white helmets. Uh, I know that you spoke extensively about this, and you know we've spoke a lot to Vanessa Bealey. Uh, okay. and, uh, and of course, Ava Bartlett, never got to speak with Ava yet about it, but I know you've spoken a lot about this. Can you speak a little bit about that and how that's affected uh, the situation in the Middle East? Well, we talk about a PSYOP, you know. This is an organization that was founded by a quote-unquote former British intelligence officer. It's funded primarily by the UK and US governments, but it's still called an NGO. How, how does that work? Uh, and if they're all volunteers <laughs> just out rescuing people, but they've been given something like $130 million. And you know, I'm, I'm sure you're, you have a nice outfit. We have a small NGO. Uh, we don't go through $130 million, <laughs> you know, so that is a lot of money to a nonprofit. So it just makes you wonder the whole thing, the whole thing really uh, stinks to high heaven. Uh, and the other thing that we do know is that they only operate in, in rebel-held areas, in, in areas held by al-Nusra, which is al-Qaeda in, in Syria. So, and when, when, when places have been cleared of, of uh, al-Qaeda, of terrorists, when uh, Assad clears them, or when the, with Russian help, the White Helmets don't stay behind saying, okay, let's rebuild the, this. No, they, they're the first ones on the bus to get out of there with al-Qaeda. And I don't think either of the three of us, if we had a choice to get in a bus with al-Qaeda, would do it. So it just in itself, uh, really, if you think through it, this logic tells you there's something very wrong with this narrative. It, it is. And, you know, the thing, Daniel, that we're seeing, though, is the situation is not calming down. I mean, we know General Wesley Clark 
uh, he blew the whistle about uh, our involvement as the United States government, that we would be there to overthrow those seven nations. Of course, their time frame was qu quite a bit off, five years. And, uh, and, and of course, Russia is probably uh, one of the biggest hindrances to that, and even Iran. I know that um, from a Jewish perspective, most people don't like it when I speak about Iran. I'm not crazy about the government of Iran. But nonetheless, uh, Iran has played a big role in uh, trying to help combat against ISIS and Russia, even greater role in trying to take back the country with President Assad. And of course, um, you know, we, we know too much of the leaks that have come out on that, even with WikiLeaks and stuff. I'd like you to weigh in on the, on, on the scenario that, that we're looking at there, especially in the case of Russia, because now Russia has brought in the S-300 system, and yet even though they're trying, you know, as allies of Israel, there's one thing a lot of people don't even realize is that the missiles they give the Syrian government uh, for that has still got a limited, limited uh, range of only 75 kilometers. So they're still taking Israel into consideration uh, at a great peril, but also trying to minimize their risk in the country uh, as well. But can you kind of give us uh, your thoughts on this situation uh, with Russia, with Iran's evolve, involvement, and how that plays out on this geopolitical scale? Well, the thing about Iran is that, you know, it wouldn't be my preference to live in a theocracy. It's not my cup of tea necessarily. Uh, but the fact of the matter does stand, regardless of all of its faults, and all countries have faults, uh, you talked about uh, your, your Jewish viewers. It has the second largest Jewish community in the Middle East after That's Israel. Right. So That's right. uh, obviously there's something there that they don't feel as threatened that they want to leave as they have in other countries. So uh, perhaps they're not getting harassed. Maybe we're getting lied to by the neocons uh, who, who want nothing more than to create chaos everywhere, create misery. And you better believe if they start blowing up Iran, if they start a war with Iran like they want, the Jewish community is either going to be scapegoated there uh, they're going to have their lives turned upside down. Things are going to be much worse for them. So this whole idea that the neocons are out liberating people uh, is, is a real farce. Uh, but, you know, you, you mentioned the S-300s, and it's an interesting. I've seen some people talk about how it's stabilized the region. And it, it made me think for a while because you think it would almost be destabilizing because you're entering a new weapon system, even if it's a defensive weapon system. But in reality, it, it provides us some sort of certainty. Uh, there was an uncertainty with the, with the continuous Israeli raids. There are about 200 over the last year in Syria, and it was reaching a fever pitch where something really bad was going to happen. We saw the, the shoot down of the, of the, of the Russian plane, uh, and things were going to escalate. So I think this was a way to de-escalate action. We haven't seen a lot more strikes. We've also seen you know, some, some indications that, uh, that even the Israelis are starting to calm down a little bit over the need to overthrow Assad. So I think it's, it's had probably, at the end of the day, a positive effect. It is true. I believe it has had a positive effect as well. But I know right now that uh, the Israelis and the Americans are, are once again training on how to overcome the S-300. Uh, and I believe they're doing this in Ukraine now. Uh, so I don't know where that's going to go at this point here. But uh, uh, it, it, it is very uneasy for me as I watch this because I, I keep trying with my own people, uh, the Jewish people that, you know, that we are, you know, we love our, our Jewish brothers and sisters as well, but to try to realize that, you know, we've got to go back to the, to the old saying that we hear in America is, I know it's a biblical saying, but, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. And, and in fact, we share a DNA, a genealogy with, with, with Syrians as well as with Palestinians. And, uh, and we've got to, start treating people the way we want to be treated as well. And uh, I know that Jer the Jerusalem Post came out not too long ago and had mentioned uh, in their article there how that Israel, for the first time I'd ever seen it mentioned, that we had been arming uh, the, the rebel groups on our own borders and giving them cash. And uh, that would be Al-Qaeda and Al-Nusra. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd like, and I know my wife's got some questions about this as well, and I'm going to give this over to her for a little bit here about your thoughts, how, how this relationship works with the United States and with Israel. And maybe I should hand that over to you to discuss ask that question there, because you have, a better, you have a better perspective on that. Well, I just want to talk about foreign policy in the United States. You are an expert at it. And I'm going to rant a little bit like a mother. I have a 15-year-old 15, yeah. 15 son who is going from homeschooling right now to um, yeah. high school. And I know recruiters are going to come, 
And uh, what the recruiters tell our youth and parents is that our soldiers, American soldiers, are fighting wars for our way of life, for protecting our freedom and our rights and our democracy. Now, we know that is not entirely true. And I want to ask you, because, because as, as factual information is and shows us, is that these Middle East wars do not benefit United States in any way. They don't benefit us financially. They do not benefit us morally. So I want to ask you, who is the elephant in the room here? <laughs> Whose wars are we really fighting? Yeah, I think in a way we're fighting a philosophical war because, you know, we, we embrace the idea of non-interventionism, which is that the U.S. should should uh, pursue friendship and free trade and trade with other nations who seek the same, uh, but entangling alliances with none. So if you if you espouse that philosophy, which is a peace philosophy, uh, uh, certainly self-defense, we're not pacifists, uh, then you then you don't you don't view these wars, you don't view the interventions as a way uh, to, to help America be safer. But if you believe in the U.S. global military empire, if you think that we need to have a thousand bases overseas, thousands of troops stationed uh, from here to there, we need to control the South China Sea, we need to have our fingers in every pie, then maybe you're always going to say more and more. We need a bigger military budget, bigger military budget. But, you know, when I look around, I see the bigger military budget benefits a very small layer of society, the well-connected, uh, the revolving door of politics, and it leaves a lot of people trying to eke out a living in the rest of the country, paying higher and higher taxes, or seeing their currencies devalued to pay for this aggressive military, this aggressive foreign policy. So who does it benefit if you've got military in a thousand bases, but we're broke at home, uh, and even if we have enemies, now we're at their mercy. So, you know, it just, it doesn't make sense. Yes, but something worries me even more. And, uh, you know, not too long ago, United States and Israel had these uh, military exercises. They're called Juniper Cobra. They happened in 2018, a few months back. About 2,500 American military personnel was involved. And according to Israeli media, that was the largest exercise of its kind. I mean, they had these exercises about a decade already, but this one was like largest military exercise of its kind. And what worries me is that uh, there was a General Clark who uh, said something to military media there. And he said that our soldiers are prepared to die for the Jewish state. Yeah. And they are even prepared to go on the military command of Israeli commanders. So I want to know your opinion on this. Is this constitutional? Is this is this the right thing to do? Yeah, I think it's 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 really a, it's a dangerous thing because what it does is it creates a, what we call a moral hazard. You know, if you it's just like if you talk about as as a school child, if you've got a big uh, tough guy behind you, you're going to be a little bit more aggressive with your with your schoolyard playmates. You know you have someone backing you up. And it may cause you to make decisions that you shouldn't or wouldn't normally make. And I think that's the, uh, unfortunately, the, the, the relationship now between the U.S. and Israel lends itself to Israel feeling this way, that they're, that they're backstopped by the big U.S. military. And they can act however they want in the region. It doesn't matter. And I think it's, it's, it's not necessarily good for Israel's security to have that. Uh, in mind, because A, there might come a time where the U.S. is not able to come to its aid. If you look at how our economy is going, the real economy, not the fake economy, <laughs> there may be a time we can't we can't come to their aid, and then and it, and it also may deter them uh, from solving their own problems in the Middle East in a different way. You know, we had a, a conference in uh, in uh, in August, the Ron Paul Institute, uh, where we had a uh, great Lebanese American uh, trader and investor and philosopher, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And he was talking about the times before uh, we had all of the politicians getting involved in the Israel-Palestinian conflict. He was talking about how uh, trade and relationships uh, were flourished between the Jewish and Palestinian people. And he, he, he's convinced, and I think he's probably right, that if the politicians would just get out of it, they'd find a way to go back to this era where they would have to live with their neighbors and figure out uh, how to work things out. And it wouldn't be a perfect world, but I think it would be a less uncertain world. Well, you know, uh, Daniel, that back before Iraq war, Benjamin Netanyahu spoke to United States Congress and he said that he knows that uh, without any shadow of doubt, he knew that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction and we found out otherwise. It wasn't true. 
Now, he's also advocating that Iran is very close uh, to having nuclear weapon. Uh, would you believe him? Is, is that really true? Because in back in a uh, few months back, I, I will I'll read your tweet here. You said, Israel just itching to suck U.S. into war with Iran after innumerable Israeli strikes killing dozens of Iranian legally in Syria. The one time Syria fires back, it's Iranian aggression. Someone needs to tell Bibi to take his medication. I agree. I agree. I, I think he, he forgot to take his Zoloft, right? But uh, it seems like he forgets his medication every day. So uh, can you please tell me, I mean, how does Israel... Um, how does Israel provoke Iranians? So, because it seems like they're anticipating they want this attack on them so they can attack Iran. Yeah, and I, I'll just warn you, viewers, my tweets can be a little uh, spicy at times. And oh, so I, I do, like your spicy I try, tweets. Yeah. <laughs> I try to keep it a little. But, you know, Netanyahu has his own problems. He has a long history as a politician. And like all politicians, uh, he's prone to, let's say, inventing uh, things. There are very few exceptions. I have to. I happen to be uh, fortunate enough to work for the one who is an exception, but they love to they love to embellish stories. And Netanyahu has been saying for at least 20 years that Israel is you know 15 minutes away from the nuclear weapon. Yes. So it's you know, and he goes to the UN with his crazy charts. Yes. Uh, he loves to have a very dramatic presentation, mm -hmm. but he's not really been able to back up a lot of his. And this is true with a lot of the neocons; uh, they're not able to back up the rhetoric with facts. And I think that that has been the case with Netanyahu. And I think he's actually now in danger of just not being believed at all. He had a big show a couple of weeks ago with the UN, and it just sort of fizzled out. Uh, people don't listen to him anymore. And so I think that's what happens when you when you cry wolf. And, uh, you know, he's not really doing a great service, I don't think, to his people uh, by doing so. You know, I'd like to address on this as well, Daniel, because when when we look at this, we realize that a lot of the evangelical community, which is a heavy supporters of President Trump, uh, really stand with Israel. And I have always stood with Israel as well. Uh, myself, my wife, and I both are very strong advocates for our people. But when we look at this, I mean, from the idea of standing with Israel in a military and backing them, if it wasn't so much things that are being instigated in the Middle East and these wars are being artificially started, uh, which I know from experience of working with the government myself, just how much destabilization that the government does. I've seen it from my own eyes, so I know that we do this. Uh, and then when we get into a situation like this, you want to stand with Israel, you know, in one way, but we cannot allow Israel just to have a free rope to just go do everything they want in the Middle East. In the case of Iran, I always felt like that the Iran has become the target because of the Silk Road initiative, and they want to make sure they have the right government in control uh, so that they can have a better access to this. Uh, but if Israel was truly threatened by their neighbors, and we Israel was truly living peaceful, trying to do the right things in the Middle East, uh, I would say then, yes, we should take and do all we can to help support Israel in any type of conflict that would happen in the Middle East there. But the, the sad thing is I'm seeing just to the contrary. I'm seeing the, and it's not the Israeli people, because we have a lot of Israelis that are advocates against the violence that's being committed by, under, under the authority of the Israeli government, under the Likud party, against the Syrians, against uh, the Iranians, etc. And, you know, so... I, so I try to look at that in a balanced respect, now, and I'd like to get your thoughts on that as well. Well, one of the problems that, that, we, that we notice, especially as libertarians, is there's a tendency to conflate the people with the state. Yes. You know, and when, when, when people say we when they mean politicians in Washington, you know, we just bombed Syria. Well, I didn't do it. You didn't do it. Exactly. It was some politicians. So you can stand with Israel, the people of Israel, and still not like the government, you know, exactly. if you if you choose to do so. And I mean, I love America, but I am I am extremely critical of its foreign policy because I love America and I want it yes. to be a better country. So I think if people could kind of get rid of the worship of the state and maybe worship a different entity or maybe not anything at all, whatever. But worshiping the state, I think, is kind of a dangerous cult. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. And that's okay. where we look at it as well. Daniel, is that we're, we, we value the people of Israel and we stand with our with our people there 
uh, but we realize that there are those that are in power that are not doing justice for the nation, uh, especially in light of the, the things that are happening in the Middle East at this point there. Go ahead, I know you had some more questions. No, I just, uh, th th that would be my, kind of my last addition, and okay. then you can speak more. But I, I want to thank you for advocating for peaceful uh, foreign policy in the United States. We don't believe that the United States needs to be in these wars at all. I, we don't believe it helps Israel in any way uh, uh, at all, and or America. But, uh, you know, when Mr. Trump was campaigning for a president, he spoke very well. He said that we don't need to be in Syria. He's going to withdraw troops from Syria. So there was a lot of hope that he's going to do the right thing. However, now we see as he's so-called draining the swamp, he kind of seems to be surrounding himself with the warmongering swamp, like Bolton, for example, who said recently that in 2018 we're going to attack Iran. So we, we see that he surrounded himself with people who are very pro-war and uh, this war in Middle East, uh, so the, the swamp is not being drained at all. And his foreign policy mirrors the foreign policy of previous administrations. So I would like your opinion on that. Yeah, I think that's true. And it's just unfortunate because we saw with George W. Bush, uh, he comes into office, not a super curious guy, not a real book reader, not an intellectual, um, not a lot of foreign policy experience. And the neocons love that. You know, and I've, I've worked in think tanks in Washington, D.C. before I went to work for Dr. Paul. And the neocons love someone like this because it's putty in their hands. And the same is true with Donald Trump. He's a real estate guy. He's a mover. He's a shaker. He closes deals. He makes negotiations. He was a, you know, he's a New Yorker. Mm -hmm. And so he comes in without a lot of curiosity on foreign affairs and without a lot of experience. And so he turns to someone and say, hey, give, give me someone with experience. Give me someone in foreign policy. And unfortunately, Washington is populated by people who spend their entire careers there, regardless of whether they're Democrats or Republicans, basically saying the same thing. We can control the rest of the world without ever stopping to think, does the rest of the world want to be controlled by us? And how might they fight back if we do that? So, you know, the bench is a little bit thin uh, for so-called experts that are non-interventionists or that are realists or that are at least not neocons. Uh, and it is very difficult. It's a systemic problem. You know, how do you, how do you rise to the top of your profession when you say, well, I want to do less, you know? Uh, uh, it's, you usually want to do more if you, if you advocate something. So... It's, it's a systemic problem. There's no easy answer. And it is unfortunate. The candidate Trump sounded great on Russia and on, uh, he sounded, he was always terrible on Iran, but he sounded great on Russia and Syria and Afghanistan and elsewhere. But he's in a trap now. I don't know how he's going to get out of it. You know, speaking of that type of a trap, Daniel, one thing that we're watching right now is you know, since President Trump has come into office, and, and we were very optimistic, hopefully, thinking that something could change. Uh, but we knew that um, uh, President Obama, former President Obama, had sent in all this massive military equipment on Russia's border. Uh, we know the situation in Ukraine, uh, Crimea, none of, none of this is going away. Uh, and of course, the size of the drills, the size that Russia had uh, not too long ago and uh, here in 2018, now the United States also beginning their drills up in Norway, uh, closer to Russia's border and all the violations. The United States, uh, President Trump talking about pulling out of the uh, nuclear uh, arms uh, treaty there with Russia. It seems to me that we are really getting in a very dangerous scenario um, and We'd like for you just to, you know, kind of like in our final uh, part of the interview here, if you could kind of weigh in on this. And even if you want to take this in the direction of China as well, because we know there's a lot of unrest as well with China and the United States. What's your thoughts on this? Uh, because nothing seems to have changed when President Trump came in. We still are sending more military over on the borders. Uh, and this escalation between Russia and the United States is rapidly growing and it doesn't seem like Putin is the, is the cause of this, if anything. And, I, and I'm not trying to take up for Russia in this case, but just being fair about it. Uh, every, everything that's ever happened over there, when Obama was in office, it was always Putin retaliating, but mainstream media was lying to the people. And I know you've talked about this before, where 
the uh, experts that mainstream media is using are, are generally very uh, pro for the, for, the, for the deep state and the military industrial complex. Not maybe the deep state as far as that terminology, but for the industrial military complex. That's a lot of things to talk about in one. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I know you Well, they're all in things. one club. The elite journalists are all in the same club with politicians. I mean, sometimes literally they hang out, they talk to each other. They don't like people like us who challenge uh, who challenge the veracity of what they say, who challenge their fake news. You know, they're, they're all together in the club, and that's why they want to they shut us down on social media. They want to call us uh, R Russian agents and Russian bots. Mm -hmm. uh, they're desperate to keep their stranglehold on information, and, and we believe that information, the truth, really does set you free. So it really is, it really is a, a, a very difficult situation to get, to get, to get the word through. When you talk about Russia and China, it's kind of interesting how, you know, just, just sort of from a product standpoint, uh, the old ISIS, the war on terror, kind of his shelf life expired. And so we don't hear anything about that now. We have a new national security strategy that says, oh, wait, it's Russia and China that really are the threats now. And those are two big ones. And so you see the military industrial complex, uh, you know, it, with glee shaking its hands and saying, this is great. We finally got a real enemy. Uh, it's good. happy days are here again. That the end of the Cold War was a disaster, uh, and I think it really does, unfortunately, have to do a lot with that. Uh, when you talk about Ukraine, that was a real disappointment for me because I thought President Trump might at least there uh, step back and take a deep breath. It was one of the most boneheaded moves of the Obama administration uh, to go in and uh, really, you know, launch a coup in Ukraine against a, already a very delicate society. East and West Ukraine have very different characteristics. Uh, most definitely, and to go there and try to blow it apart was the stupidest thing to do. You end up with a country where you have people in power or close to power that are out and out Nazis. You know, they're out and out. It's not a joke. You know, it's not a conspiracy theory. Uh, you know, they literally are wearing SS uniforms over right. there, and somehow this is a liberation. And then you have the, the suppression of of ethnic and linguistic minorities, uh, including. Uh, some whose language we may or may not have spoken earlier in this interview uh, in Ukraine. You have all kinds of problems that are launched by this. And, uh, you know, it just goes to show these interventions, they never end up well. If it had a good track record, maybe I would sit down and shut up. But every time they do it, it messes things up worse. Yes, yes, yes. Well, in the conclusion, I want to ask you a question, Daniel. Um, what do you think will happen to independent media here in the United States? Because we saw how they are purging independent media slowly but surely. And uh, people like you or us, we are in danger. So um, what do you think will happen? It is almost like the old Soviet Union. They could just make you disappear. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. uh, we can, uh, we, it's even worse because we can keep doing our shows, but nobody can watch them. So it, it's really chilling. And our fervent hope is that, is that the market economy, the market will come forward with an alternative that's not centralized, that can't be controlled by the establishment and the elites. Uh, and, and I think there are some good signs. Uh, and maybe there is um, uh, some kind of crypto a uh, bit a uh, blockchain source of things that will give us more privacy and and enable us to connect with people but you know the era of you know there was a very sweet era for a few years where we could really expand our facebook and our youtube and our twitter uh and really speak freely and that era unfortunately is now over and i don't think it'll return so it's up to us we have to work harder now to figure out how to connect with people that's right. I agree That's with that. Agree Daniel, can you share with the people about how that they can get better uh, educated from the uh, Ron Paul Institute and uh, and share with, you know, just how that they can connect with you guys on Twitter, uh, et cetera, so that they'll know how to do that? Sure. Well, our website is ronpaulinstitute.org. <clears throat> and we try to put up, say, three or four articles a day. About half of them are are in-house we produce and half of them are people that we know uh, and who we can vouch for it's just a curated thing if you read these three or four articles you should get a sense of what's going on and what to think about it uh, and we also do the daily ron paul liberty report on youtube it's live at noon eastern time monday through friday uh, and we would love to have your your viewers join us and uh, see some shows some of them are provocative some you'll agree with some you won't uh, but that's what it's all about. So we, we, we hope people will do this. Follow us on Facebook and on Twitter at Ron Paul Institute. And uh, just thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much. And 
Listen, guys, definitely tune in. We watch a lot of the uh, broadcasts there on the Ron Paul Institute. It's always a blessing for us. Uh, it's another perspective, and uh, I think you should take and do that as well. I'm Stephen Benoon with Yana Benoon, and uh, we want to thank you, uh, Daniel Adams, for joining us uh, here on Israeli News Live today. Erev Tov. Kissing you.